know. I just feel like there should be some kind of like music or something for this part or <laughs> like elevator. Just waiting for the thing. There was a montage of images of you writing a book, Michelle, that came <laughs> over the screen. I'd be right here. I'd just be like. <laughs> Hey, hello, welcome everyone to another PNP Live. My name is Bashan Horsley. I am part of the event staff at Politics and Pros. Before we begin today's event, I just wanted to go over a couple of quick items. The first is that at any time during this event, uh, you can go to the chat section where you'll be able to find a link which will take you directly to the Politics and Pros website where you can purchase a copy of Pure Flame. We of course highly encourage you and thank you for your patronage as that allows us to continue to bringing these uh, Zoom events. Also, if any of you have any questions for Ms. Orange, we would ask for you to place it in the separate Q&A box, not the chat section, just so that can help us facilitate the Q&A period, uh, keep everything organized, and hopefully your question will get seen and read. I have the pleasure of introducing Michelle Orange. Michelle is the author of the essay collection, This Is Running For Your Life which was named the best book of the year by The New Yorker. Her writing has appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's, The New York Times, Slate, Book Forum, The Nation, and many other outlets. A contributing editor and columnist for the Virginia Quarterly Review, she is a faculty mentor in the graduate writing program at Goucher College and an assistant and an adjunct assistant professor of writing at Columbia University. Michelle is in conversation today with Leslie Jamison. Leslie is the author of the essay collection, Make It Scream, Make It Burn, the New York Times bestsellers, The Recovering and the Empathy Exams, and the novel, The Gin Closet. She is a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine, and her work has appeared in publications including The Atlantic, Harper's, The New York Times Book Review, The Oxford American, and The Virginia Quarterly Review. She directs the graduate nonfiction program at Columbia University. Without any further ado, Ms. Jamison and Ms. Orange. Hey, Michelle. <laughs> I wonder if you can hear the fire station across the street. I'm like, do I have to mute myself in my own, <laughs> my own conference? Oh my God, no, I love it. Cause I'm like, for the first time in 18 months, I'm not in Brooklyn and I'm already just having panic attacks from the absence of fire engines and- <laughs> <It's basically laughs> <great. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, it's so great to be um, here in this Zoom space with you tonight <laughs> and talking about your beautiful book. As everybody knows, probably it is the birthday of this wonderful, wonderful book. As Michelle knows, I love this book with like so many different parts of myself, my writer self, my daughter self, my mother self, my reader self, um, a bunch of selves I don't even have names for, but that <laughs> were spoken to. Um, and I'm just so excited that we get to talk a little bit about it tonight and so excited that um, folks are here. I, I put in the chat, but um, if people want to say, um, you know, kind of who you are and where you're zooming in from, it would be great to get a sense of, of who's with us. Um, and I thought maybe we'd chat for a few minutes and then maybe you'll read to us um, just to, to ground us in the book and we'll talk some more. Um, uh, but I thought, I thought maybe we'd start out if you would be willing to just share a little bit about the origins of this book and kind of introduce us to it, what, what your um, kind of where and how it began and how your conception of what this book was kind of evolved over time and, and as your relationship with your mother evolved, just like tell us a little bit of that origin story. Sure. Um, and but first, I just want to say, Leslie, thank you so much for doing this. It's like just such a pleasure. And we've been talking about, you know, the intersections of our own lives over recent years. And it's just meaningful for me to, to be able to talk with you about this book in particular. And, and thank you to Politics and Prose. Um, this is so exciting. Um, as for the origins of the book, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, with a book or any sort of big piece of writing, it's in my experience, and I'm sure this is probably true for you, it's, it's a number of things orbiting you or you orbiting them and then a confluence sort of 
takes place and you realize that you, you, you might have something that you, you want to focus on for a few years. Um, and for me, one of those, I mean, a, a main element really had to do with my mother um, and my becoming more conscious of her mortality after her own mother's death, which was almost exactly 10 years ago, actually. Um, and, you know, realizing that there, there were some things that I needed to figure out for myself uh, about our relationship, um, but also that there, there might be a story in there of some sort. And, and that became more and more clear to me as our relationship began to actually expand um, and change and transform. And I, um, we just became more comfortable together. We became more able to communicate about certain things that we really needed to talk about. And, and that was all wonderful, um, but it was that part of it was a very slow um, uh, process. And, and then on the other hand, there were these larger sort of more abstract interests that I was, I was circling to do with, um, you know, feminism, storytelling, um, maternal legacy. And actually I, I, I opened a, a book that I'd read around that time, this Vivian Gornick collection, The End of the Novel of Love because it was one of the essays in here that really kind of sparked me and sparked my thinking about this book. Um, and in it, she, she makes an argument about um, the idea, I mean, I'll just read a line from it. She writes from Oedipus to Freud, our idea of the struggle to be in the world has taken its character from the conflict between fathers and sons, um, a history of violence and urgency that for centuries has stirred the imaginative act of self-description. And what she goes on to argue is that um, in fact, now, in, you know, in a modern world, in an industrialized world, in a um, capitalist world, um, that in fact, it's mother-daughter constructions that are a more apt vehicle in certain ways for all these big questions about, you know, what she's described as how to be in the world, you know, how to, how to leave home, how to individuate, how to be a hero, how to um, live a good life, honor your ancestors. And I was, intrigued by that and maybe even convinced by that. And yet it was so uh, absent from my, from my own life, from my own writing and from that of the writing of most of the women um, that I knew and admired. And I was interested in that. I wanted to uh, understand more about that, about, how, you know, and that essay is a good, I think it's from the nineties. It's a good 20 years old, but just, just the tension between being com in complete agreement with that and, and having no, no sort of real attachment to it and nothing that I could point to that. Um, and I, I wanted to, in a way, provide my own answer to that or, or my own sort of parallel discussion along those lines. And um, that was where I saw an interweaving of, of um, you know, all of those questions um, with my mother's story, her mother's story, <clears throat> you know, her mother being born in 1915, my mother being born more mid-century, you know, it, that, that century encompasses an enormous amount of, of change. And, um, you know, my mother's life is complicated as I try and get into in the book. And, and I was so, uh, I just became more and more convinced that there, there was a way in which I could tell both of those, I could try and tell both of those stories in a kind of like parallel, I guess. I love, I love so much. I feel like that story of how this book began not only like summons these wonderful memories for me of um, sitting like at my kitchen table in Brooklyn talking about this book at different stages and it's evolving iterations, but also just your response opens up so much of what I love about the book. Like even, even that idea of, of having a deep response to an idea, but also feeling drawn, not just to explore it's sort of direct or easy application to one's life, but like the gaps or the frictions or the ways it doesn't quite apply or that space between the sort of narratives we receive and the narratives we live. And I feel like your book so beautifully like investigates all those complicated crevices in your relationship with your mother, where it's neither the archetype of sort of sublime maternal closeness or merging, nor is it the archetype of like, 
kind of reductive antagonism. It's like, there's a, there's a deep, complicated, evolving love there. And you sort of, you hold it up against certain narratives or certain paradigms or certain understandings of what the maternal bond is, is, or how we understand it or what maternal legacy is or how we understand that. But you're, you're looking at kind of, um, gaps and wrinkles and underminings of of those narratives as much as their application and I feel like that's one of the great kind of um pleasures intellectually and emotionally for me of of this book and what you've done here um so it's wonderful to hear you speak about that quote as part of its origin story um I would love Maybe, I mean, I have a thousand questions for you and I'm sure that people um, here have so many questions as well. And I would actually encourage people, you don't have to wait till the end to put your questions in the Q&A, put them in whenever you want and I will see them there and um, turn to them. Um, so don't be shy about, about putting them in there. But I think first we all get to be graced by hearing you read a little bit from the book, which I know I would love. Definitely, I will read, I will read a very little bit just because it's, it's Zoom and you know, um, but yeah, I, I would love to do that. So I'm just going to read from the beginning of the first chapter because I, I think it, it it extends well, you know, just trying to explain um, what the book is up to. Uh, so I'll start. Um, during one of the texting sessions that became our habit over the period I now think of as both late and early in our relationship, my mother revealed the existence of someone named Janice Jerome. The context of our exchange was my need for context. Two years earlier, I'd set out to capture the terms of our estrangement, to build a frame so fierce and broad it might finally hold us both. If not an opponent to the cause, my mother was a wily associate, allied in theory but elusive by nature, inclined to defy my or any immuring scheme. The channel that opened between us across her 60s and my 30s spanned two countries and bypassed decades of stalled communication. We pinged and texted our way into daily contact, a viable frequency. This was its own miracle, a combined feat of time, technology, and pent up need. As she neared 70, the repeated veering of our habitually light pattern driven exchanges into fraught personal territory was my doing, a response to a new and unnameable threat. Perhaps she had felt it too, that there might not be time to know all the people I had been in her absence that I might never meet the many versions of her I had discounted or failed to recognize, that we wouldn't tell the most important stories. If our withholding was mutual, <clears throat> it was part of a tradition I took from her and she from her mother. I sought a context for this too, the narrative affliction so common to maternal lines and so little changed by a century of marked progress. If anything, the supposed release, excuse me, <clears throat> This is more than I've spoken in days. <laughs> the supposed release from passlessness and isolation that kept a woman from imagining herself as universal, worthy of story and its ritual transmission, had further troubled a primary bond. Mother-daughter relationships are generally catastrophic, Simone de Beauvoir once observed. This we knew. This everybody knows. It has been understood too that the general catastrophe of mother-daughter relationships makes them less and not more interesting, unfit for inscription. As much as anyone, I've manifested this view. For the better part of my life, only contemplating our relationship interested me less than contemplation of my mother. As a writer, the subject appeared fatal. Our catastrophe represented an absence of imagination and vitality. It was where story went to die. By the time my mother introduced me to Janice Jerome, however, early in 2016, something had shifted. Unbeknownst to her, I'd spent the previous two years struggling to articulate the terms of a new project about legacy, feminism, and failure, questions I sought to examine and refract through the prism of mother-daughter relations. In my half conception of it, the project would rest in the shadow of my mother's mortality, colored and inflected as I saw fit by the vague theoretical specter of her loss. It would deploy specific elements of her life, our lives, to larger abstract ends. As a matter of inability, as much as instinct, it would privilege argument over plot, idea over narrative, something else over straight memoir. When an editor asked that summer why I wanted to write such a book, I made a comment about it being the hardest thing I could do at that moment, like I had any idea. 
Past 70 when she shrugged off mother-daughter affairs. Beauvoir refused to identify as a feminist for most of her life. As a product of a similar, if not the same confusions, I found comfort in this. I seek a heritage in it, however twisted, and heritage, I see a heritage in it, however twisted, and heritage is what I seek. I had not turned to my mother for such things. She seemed to prefer it that way. Like her, I learned by example and lack of example, not to look to the women closest to me for a sense of who and how to be, what was possible in life. Unlike her, I had a mother who lived out a neoclassical epic of self-determination, 1970s housewife turned MBA turned CEO. Still her example proved dim, her transformations hidden, their terms boggled. This appeared to me by design. The breach between us had not been a cost of her emancipation, but its requirement. As a child, I stopped seeing her clearly. In adolescence, I stopped wanting to. I charged forth into an old and new kind of catastrophe, despite a near complete failure to know my mother. My own becoming was both guided and thwarted by a determined effort not to become her. Standing on the far side of that calamity, I began coaxing our relationship toward disclosure, background, dimension, a shared line of analysis. It was my habit and my handicap, inquiry as an act of love. If she saw it that way, my mother remained a slippery subject, too cool-minded and wildly individual to suffer grand unifying theories or to share space with the dominant social movement of her time. I respected her resistance even as I weighed its consequence. Early in this process, her lack of interest in feminism interested me the most. What was more feminist, I thought, than the purity of its confusion. I found her attitude perverse, but not unfamiliar. I had sent at least one of myself into the shadow sisterhood made up of women who learned to live for themselves, pretending a discreet existence, hoarding their petty freedoms. I may have met my mother in that lonely place. I would not have known. I'll stop there. <laughs> so much it's really really um it's beautiful to hear you read that and it um so many of the things that i hope we can talk about are ideas or tensions um threads that you open up so eloquently in those pages um so it just feels like a wonderful place to begin um and you know i guess one of those places is you know when you're writing about the this kind of aversion that you felt and I think um I have also felt um maybe in slightly different ways but to writing uh to writing into the mother-daughter bond and story um you know at one point you say it was where story went to die and I want to talk to you about like some of the many things that struck me as quite narratively tricky about what the story stories plural that you're telling here um so you're you're writing into as you lay out in these pages this extraordinarily difficult like deeply baggaged bond between mothers and daughters um so I'd love to hear you talk about that narrative difficulty just like what it actually felt like to write into the place where story goes to die in that sense. But I also was curious about, you know, you're writing about, among other things, your mother's experience of chronic and recurring illness. And there's something so narratively tricky about writing these kinds of difficulty and suffering that recur and recur and recur. And there's not like this easy beginning, middle and end narrative structure to that kind of experience or, or caregiving for somebody else through that kind of experience. Um, so the kind of difficulty of writing illness and difficulty in writing pain that kind of doesn't come in a neat narrative package. Um, and also writing also a story of, of mortality and the kind of prolonged experience of dying. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you could speak into kind of any of those difficulties, the difficulty of writing that bond, the difficulty of writing chronic illness, the difficulty of writing a story that like spans across so many decades and spans across like decades of illness as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the answer that comes to mind, the quick one is just that it was a mess. <laughs> it was a messy process. It was a long and, uh, you know, tortuous uh, process to try and get to the place um, where I felt like I could tell the story I was trying to tell, you know, that the, the line, you know, that I, that I just read about 
I, I remember very clearly speaking to that editor, you know, almost five years ago now, and, and her asking me, why this, why, why do you, why this story now? And I really felt like I want to write it because I have no idea how to write it. You know, I think it's the hardest thing I could do, but I really had no idea. <laughs> like I had, I had no idea. Um, uh, and so, well, let, let me, uh, there's two things that I, I definitely want to touch on um, with regard to trying to write about illness, but also that larger question of um, how I found my way into, into trying to not just write about um, my mother and her mother, but, you know, this, this larger question of how we write stories about mothers and daughters. Um, you know, I mentioned the Gornick and I, I was so persuaded by it, um, but I also, um, you know, on the one hand, I, I, I felt the lack, in reading that, I, I felt the lack that she's describing. I felt the lack of that, um, that archetype, that model, that narrative construction where um, a, a mother and daughter can have a story where that's heroic ultimately, where that, that, that involves, you know, an individuation that um, uh, is triumphal um, rather than just sort of drab or catastrophic or, or, or what have you. Um, and at the same time, I, and as I, I this was my way of trying to work through some of these questions. I'm like deeply, so that another way of saying that is that I am powerfully drawn to story as most human beings are. I, I have a need for story. I have a desire to understand my experience in the world through story. And I'm also extremely wary of story and I'm skeptical of, of story and the ways that it can um, entrap us. And there was something in the, in the narratives of feminism in particular, and then in my mother's own life and my life in particular, um, that um, bore out that same tension, those, those same two things. And, and that for me, this is getting sort of abstract, but that really was the way that I found um, uh, into telling this particular story. I felt like I needed to um, not just negotiate that tension throughout the book in different ways and on different levels, but that the book had to somehow like emerge out of that negotiation and maybe try and like point in a, in a, th a third direction. Um, and, and again, I know this is, this is a bit abstract, but that really was the, the thing that kept me, uh, that I kept coming back to as, as, a, as a guiding thread. In terms of writing about um, illness and uh, suffering, you know, that was part uh, of the book. You know, when I say I had no idea how hard it was gonna be, you know, my mom became ill almost two years into my uh, working on this project. So it, it just changed the whole, it changed the scope of it. It changed the terms and the, um, for a good, the almost the full two years that she was sick, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to write illness. I didn't, uh, I, I just sort of flailed. I just flailed. I didn't want to write it. Uh, I, I was, it was just chaos. Um, and it's also just intensely dramatic. And so the, one of the challenges that it presented to me, and I don't, I don't know if you would relate to this, Leslie, but, you know, as an essayist, it's not that the two things are separate, obviously, but for, for me, my skill set as a dramatist, I'm not a dramatist, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm not super comfortable writing plot or scene or a lot of dialogue. And, and in terms of the writing challenge, one of the things that uh, I was up against once I understood um, that if I was going to move forward with this book, I was going to have to incorporate my mother's illness and then her death um, was how to write uh, more seeing, you know, how, how, to, how to handle this sort of like neutron bomb <laughs> that, that like life had presented me, which is a parent's serious illness and then their death um, on narrative terms. That's a tricky thing to, to deal with on all sorts of levels. Um, and the personal one being obviously one, you know, what am I comfortable sharing? What do I feel is, is ethical and appropriate? Um, so to try and be concise about it, I think one of the places that I came out with that or, or one solution that I ended up with, and I'll just, I'll say here that I, I turned in a draft, what turned out to be a month before my mom died is when I turned in the first draft of this book. It's a completely different book than, than the one that, that um, we're, we're both looking at now. 
Um, and it was a mess, you know, and, and it, you know, my refusal to, or, or my avoidance of, of, you know, writing into this part of my mother's story and our story was, was one part of it. And one of the solutions that I came up with was that I just had to, kind of, I had to let the reader in on, I had to, I had to, I had to layer in a, a level of transparency um, and let the reader in on the difficulty that I was having telling this story um, and have them be my collaborator to some extent um, on that. And the other was that, um, you know, I, 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 I had this structuring idea of, of trying to move the book more and more toward um, scene, I guess, for lack of a better word, dialogue and action, action, um, because part of the story, and, and one of the reasons why the first draft just didn't work was because I didn't know who was telling the story. You know, does this person have a mother? Do they not have a mother? You know, where are they? All the questions that we ask, you know, in, the, in of our students, you know, where are they standing? What are they? What are the stakes? Um, and I didn't know that. And, and once I did. I, f I, I felt that one way out of the, the predicament I was in was to have part of the movement of the book be that of a narrator who, you know, has one, has a, has a certain set, of, ha has one MO in her writing life, you know, that things that work well for her in terms of, um, you know, writing her, her experience, writing her engagement with the world and has now come up against a circumstance where none of those things are gonna work. <laughs> and um, uh, part of the solution to that is to, or, or you know, what one, one way to address that um, is just to move more and more towards uh, bodies and rooms with things happening between them, you know, because that was actually my experience was that the thing that mattered most was, was bodies and rooms, you know, at that point um, uh, in my life and in my mom's life. And so uh, that's a sort of roundabout way of, of trying to answer the question about how to write about illness and suffering, but that's where I, that, that, that's, that's how I, um, and the other thing is it, 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 I had to ask the question, uh, you know, in terms of being okay with it, it, including my mom's illness and her death in this story, um, how do I not include it? And the answer is you can't. Um, and, and the other was that it actually folded in uh, really intuitively with all the themes I was already working with in terms of, you know, obviously legacy, transmission, identity, freedom. Um, uh, and so it was, it was about picking the moments um, that would sort of hold two or three times their weight. Rather, you know, I feel like I've heard you say this before, Leslie, I and mean, sometimes with nonfiction, especially if you're writing personally, the assumption is, and I think it probably should be, it means you're, you're, you're kind of doing it right, that like the reader's getting everything, you know, and in fact, the reader's getting like 0.3% of, of, of what you've actually been through. And so that 0.3%, it had to be, um, you know, me picking and choosing the moments that I felt um, would represent and, and, and work on a bunch of levels that I needed them to. and and that's how I, I came to terms myself with writing about my mom and her suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's so interesting to think about that, that um, process, which I, you know, absolutely identify with of sort of choosing the, the 0.3% or the moments of, of bodies and rooms that might sort of serve and illuminate and anchor these like kind of infinite abstract reckonings. Um, but I, I really love the way you framed it because it actually, sometimes when I talk about that phenomenon of like the reader thinks they're getting everything or sort of total access, but actually they're just getting a very small fraction of it, which I think is actually like an idea I first got or paraphrased from Maggie Nelson, but there can sometimes be a sort of shrill or indignant tone in my voice when I'm saying it, like, well, they think that they know me, but they don't. But actually the way you put it is, is much more gracious and true to everybody, I think, which is that if you're kind of doing your job right as a writer, if, you ch if you're choosing a truly illuminating 0.3%, it will give that feeling of kind of totality and wholeness and intimacy and access even though it's just a very small fraction of the story because you're, you're kind of willing to take the reader to precisely those moments that 
you know, when you describe that first draft that was so different from the draft that you, or the version of the book that you and I are, are holding in our hands, um, I love the way you spoke about essentially the work of revision being really revision in that true deep sense of re-seeing and being willing to see and look at and write into so many of the things that you were avoiding for whatever set of reasons in that first draft. And, you know, I just think that's that's so much of the work and I'm sure so useful for so many people, writers and not writers alike to think about here in the room, right? Like what are, how can we learn from the things that we look away from rather than just kind of chiding ourselves or beating ourselves up for it, but actually see that as a kind of almost um, a map in the margins, right? A map of what we might explore in, in what we've turned away from. Um, and I love that you landed on bodies and rooms because that's what I wanted to ask you about next was, was really the role of bodies in this book. Cause you know, a couple of times as you were speaking, you were, you were saying sort of that, you know, I know that this idea is kind of abstract and your book is wrestling with kind of some of the biggest, most abstract ideas out there about what is a self, how do we um, forge ourselves in relation to the selves that forged us, our, our parents, our makers in that sense, and also the kind of lineages that we're born into of thinkers and writers and, and generations that came before. Um, but always this book is sort of engaged in those big abstract reckonings through and with bodies and details and particulars. And, you know, I think about your relationship with your mother mapped onto or enacted through both of your bodies, like the way you even describe um, walking a little bit further away from your mother, sometimes on the street, that kind of, you'd call it a tribal dance at some points. So it was like stunning moments to me to read and full of truth. Um, but also, you know, the way you talk about, chest percussions, you know, um, during some of the late stages of your mother's illness. And, um, and I just love to hear you talk a little bit about kind of the experience for you of writing close to bodies in this book, writing close to your mother's body, writing close to your own body when you felt you were doing that, um, and kind of what you, what you learned or were able to bring to the page by sticking close to bodies. What, what, mm -hmm. body, what kinds of truths bodies brought up for you here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's it's such a good question. Um, and it, that part of the book really was born of, uh, you know, sort of agreeing with myself that I, I was going to write about her illness um, in, in some detail and, and let that um, be part of the book. And then I had to sort of go back um, because my relationship with her body changed so much when she was sick, obviously, and, and, and in particular, um, in my role as a caretaker. Um, and our, I think our, our relationship, our bodily relationship, it was, it was another way to ground, you know, the, this story, obviously, as, as you're saying, in, 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 in individual experience, but also in, in a bodily experience and the extent to which the breaches that can happen between people, even um, people who are intimately uh, um, related, um, are bodily as well as, as everything else that they are. And so I wanted to chart that in it however I could. And I love that he brought up the, like when we're trying to walk in, down the street in Chicago together and how it was just impossible for some reason. And, I, and, and why would that be? Like, what is the nature of, of the, of the difficulty, um, I was interested in that, and it was it was interesting to it was just something that I ha I needed to figure out for myself, and I, I thought the, the book there, there's space for it in the book. Um, it was interesting to me that when I tried to think about our bodies and our relationship to our bodies, I didn't I there weren't any feelings, there weren't really any thoughts. It was all images, you know. I just kept seeing us in these different configurations and how um, how. Uh, the difficulty between us emerged um, that way. And it just seemed like a, an effective way to try and tell the story without telling the reader, you know, what, 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 I'm, what I'm trying to get at. Um, and I suppose um, it, it, it's, you know, I, I think one of the things I was, I was really trying to do was just find different ways to make real and accessible for the reader. Um, these very complicated um, uh, discords that can happen between people. And I, 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 I wanted to look for spaces where our relationships to our bodies actually overlapped. And, um, you know, for instance, my, my mom 
the way that I saw my mom as being quite hard on her body um, and the ways that I've been quite hard on my body and, and whether that was a, a source of our um, discomfort sharing space together. Um, and the fact, you know, I sort of talk at one point in the book about how we actually managed to build this rapport together over text. Um, and yet when we were in the same room, our bodies still seemed to not, they didn't get the memo, you know, like we were still like carrying this strange, almost magnetic, you know, uh, relationship to each other. And I just found that fascinating. And, and I wanted to, um, I just wanted to use it as a, as a, as a thread, you know, certainly once she became sick and I, I felt our bodies reattach in this, in this interesting way. Um, and then, you know, both of us having to let her body go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it's so, it's so powerful to land there because it's such a deep truth of this book that it is, you know, it is, um, by the end, really a story of mortality. And, and that is, of course, it's a story of many things, but it is a story of the body and letting the body go. Um, and, you know, as you were speaking about the kind of dance or the complicated magnetism between your body and your mother's body, I was thinking about the role of text messages in this book and texts, texts as a kind of disembodied intimacy um, and, and, you know, disembodied is a word with all kinds of new valences for all of us maybe um after the last 18 months and embodied is embodied intimacy also has all these new valences but i you know i was so struck by the ways in which the disembodiedness of text seemed to permit certain things between you and your mother and that that kind of conversation or relationship that you guys are having over text messages is sort of its own force that's interacting with those scenes in which your bodies are together in a room and that kind of relationship that's playing out across those scenes. Um, but I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the role of text in this book. It was one of the things that really struck me sort of formally, they look almost like um, poems on the page, the way that you produce them with a lot of white space. And so we can sort of see that back and forth of her texts and yours in this real conversation. Um, and I'm curious sort of what, at what point you realized or knew that the texts were gonna become part of the book in that way and what kind of role you um, see them playing or want them to play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. I, I think the texting I, I knew from the beginning was going to have to be part of it because it really was um, the sort of on ramp, <laughs> you know, to this this new phase in our relationship. And and what you say is exactly right. It was this different. You know, it was because it was this disembodied space that was separate and apart from all the other stories, all the history, all the story, our bodies, obviously, and the stories that they told. Um, and it just opened up a space where we could kind of reinvent, you know, our dynamic. Um, and so, um, and it was also the space where I began to feel more comfortable pressing her about things that made us both really uncomfortable. Um, and it, yeah, it, it just felt like um, it needed to be part of the story and I needed to extract from, you know, tens of thousands of messages, you know, those sort of snippets that would, that would help move things forward and that's uh, yeah the, the layout I'm gonna have to give credit to my partner Will because it was something I was struggling with like how to actually make make them look how to lay them out on the page in a way that you know didn't hurt your eyes and that actually complemented you know what we were trying to get at and including them and he's the one who's sort of in, in a late, later stage actually like suggested just like left justify and right justify just like they look on your phone and I, I think it, it, it works really well um yeah. Yeah. Well, there's so much, I mean, there's so much in there, the way that uh, just even spatially, the way that they're arranged on the page, there's a kind of breathing room that just literally in the white space that gets created from that layout that actually feels both for a reader and maybe within the relationship itself, like not incidental or beside the point, but kind of of the point, like how certain kinds of intimacy become even more possible when there's like a little bit of 
space there too, right? Which is like maybe something many of our therapists have to tell us about our relationships, period, or our relationships with our mothers in particular. Um, but that that sense that that sort of there's something happening that's really charged and dynamic, but it's happening. It's important that we understand it happening with those spaces in it. And especially because so many of the scenes in the book are, you know, they're spaces of hospitals or illness, which are often or, or kind of, you know, care. And there's a kind of, there can be a kind of cramped or claustrophobic quality to some of those spaces that also feels counterpointed in a way with the, the layout of those texting exchanges. Mm. Um, also and, yeah. of, I just also wanted to give a sense of like the, the, the ongoingness of a text exchange, you know, mm -hmm. the sort of having them throughout the book. Um, I wanted it to sort of reflect in some way that the, the the relief, you know, for us personally, but also the nature of texting where it's just sort of this open space that you're, you just keep sort of um, plugging into. Uh, yeah. That was essential for us, I think, in, in, in building a, or rebuilding a, a bond. It's just a different language. It's a, it's a different rhythm and, and yeah. you know, rhythm, rhythm is everything, I think, in, in, in general, but also in relationships. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, it reminded me of the ways that like in any kind of relationship or, you know, whether it's familial or romantic partnership or whatever, it's sort of, it can become so important sometimes just to like change the room or the scene that like to go for a walk rather than just sitting down or to like be, um, to go to sleep and wake up again or to eat a meal that these kind of, that, that getting to go into some other space where passing through the threshold, whether it's the threshold of like entering into a digital disembodied space together or the threshold of entering the outdoors or whatever kind of threshold, the idea that like past this threshold, we get to be a slightly different version of ourselves or how you put it earlier, like we get to like recreate ourselves slightly differently inside this dynamic. I think that's one of the beautiful things you're charting here is like how any bond worth anything is not a static thing, but like a space where you kind of both get to and have to constantly recreate you know yourselves and your own imaginings of the other rather than just sort of things staying put um mm -hmm. and I think I'm going to ask one more question that's really directly coming off of the text messages and then maybe turn to a couple of the questions that are already in the Q&A and also invite um anyone else out there with questions I'm sure there are many so go ahead and put them in the Q&A um I'll sort of be moving between our conversation and just dipping into those questions as they appear um but the the question I wanted to ask you know I was struck with the text messages another thing I really loved about them was that we get to hear your mother's voice unmediated right because you're literally drawing from these archives I mean they're they're mediated in the sense that you're there are thousands of texts and you're not reproducing all of them, but um, we do get to, we get to see so many things. We get to see her, the turns of her mind, her wit, and just here in some way that probably feels much more total vis-a-vis -vis our conversation earlier than it is. Um, but we get to hear her voice and, and even, you know, the way you describe her use of emojis. I absolutely love, like she discovers this sort of late in life fluency in emojis. It's like beautiful and perfect. Um, but I'm curious, like, it, you know, your text threads were clearly one sort of personal archive that you were drawing on when you were writing this book and reproducing in, in a limited form and like, you know, very intelligently and emotively deployed limited form. Um, but I'm just curious to hear a little bit more about that the kind of personal archival process for you in writing this book, like you were drawing, were you literally like reading kind of thousands and thousands of texts? Like, were you also going through old emails? Were you going through old papers? Were you going through old medical files? Like, what was that kind of personal research like? Yeah, it was all of that. It was, you know, and, and the texts really were essential. Um, there used to, I think they changed the function, but there used to be this function on WhatsApp where you could export all your your entire chat to a text file and, and that was I think they changed it at some point what that was sort of devastating to me but uh, starting in like 20, 2012 or something I, I did that with all of my mom's texts and so I had you know just like endless documents um to go through of that that are now just sort of a precious you know obviously personal resource to me but um you know, when I think about the, the archive process, I think of how haphazard it was, you know, for uh, like, I think in particular with some, uh, uh, you know, dread about the idea that if, if my mom just hadn't mentioned Janice Jerome to me on the night that she did, you know, how would I have 
found out. And it was just sort of a very casual thing um, that sent me down, you know, the, this rabbit hole. Um, a, a lot of things, especially before she died, were um, sort of random and haphazard in terms of my own research into personal archives. Although, um, you know, when she died, you know, I was able to go through all of her papers and um, synthesize a lot of uh, the information. And she really kept everything, the health records. Uh, there were a lot of health records that were really important and interesting. She actually did keep some hard cop copies of the Janice Jerome case. Um, and I got in touch with one of the authors of it and he gave me a lot more information um, about it, um, her old resumes. Um, it, I was in, this didn't make it into the book, but she, she'd actually printed out a particularly bitter email exchange that we had in the 90s. <laughs> that was sort of, you know, I was just sort of left to, to ponder myself why, why, uh, um, why that one in particular. Um, but, and her travel diaries were actually a huge resource for me. She kept really detailed travel diaries. And so there were like 20 or 25 notebooks um, where, where she wrote about her travels. And I sort, as I say in the book, a lot of them weren't, there was not a lot of like person, what we might think of as personal, you know, content or reflection, but they were still fascinating. You know, they, they were, they, um, you know, just opened up a window onto this person that I was trying to see from as many angles as I could. Yeah. Well, and there's, there, there's some wonderful moments like, um, when you're describing sort of even if it wasn't in the book but your own process of reflection or speculation about why you know why did she print that one particular email exchange or what about that email exchange there's a moment in the book where you um describe her looking back at some past archives of um her own journal when she was newlywed and and narrate her reaction to that journal where she says you know such beautiful writing about absolutely nothing and and it's such a complicated and illuminating moment of sort of her you engaging with her engaging with this relic of her past self um uh yeah there's so much there's so much oh, go ahead go ahead just gonna say, I, and then I, after she died I was able to read that same diary and and uh you know come to my own conclusions but yeah it was it was uh the image of her reading that and, and coming to that conclusion was poignant <laughs> for me mm -hmm. yeah well, right, and you let it stand in the book as her reaction to that text rather than the only re reaction right. one could have to it, which I think is is um, important and kind of creates a sort of room as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to some of the questions that are already here and um and <laughs> and keep my own thousand remaining questions in the in the waiting room for a moment um, because there are some really thoughtful. Um, thoughtful, thoughtful inquiries here. Um, I was thinking about what you said earlier about um, inquiry as an act of love. There's a, there's a deep thoughtfulness to these. Um, Laura Tillman says, Michelle, congratulations. When you're writing a story like this one, which doesn't follow a typical narrative structure or find emotional resolution, how do you know where and when to end? Mm. Yeah, I, I was sort of determined that there, I mean, there wasn't going to be any real resolution. And in fact, if, if there's if there's a place where I, I think the book goes thematically, it's sort of away from meaning or away from the insistence on meaning, certainly around suffering um, and death. Um, and maybe that's my answer is, is that what, once I realized that, um, that, that that became the ending, you know, that became, I, I wasn't going to write very, very, in, when you read the book, you'll see, I don't write much past my mother's death um, for a bunch of reasons, but, but also it just felt like the natural um, stopping place for the story, um, which really was so much about, um, in terms of the narrator's um, move, like the, you know the narrator's movement throughout throughout the book. It, it is it is to do with this idea of not really looking for answers, but asking the right questions, but all in service of um, or, or questioning um, the the idea that there's that there's meaning to be had, that there's um, that there is some sort of intuitive resting place for these questions. Um, and in fact, there's not really. There's there's just the there's just 
I was going to say it was just death, but there's not, I mean, the, 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 another way of saying it is that, you know, one of the, I was looking through one of my earliest notebooks when I, when I really just started thinking like, this is, this is going to be the next project. And so many of the questions that I was writing had to do with, you know, what does it mean to, what does it mean to be a woman? Because I don't know, and I never have, and I probably never will. And um, so that, that was a sort of entry point. And to some extent, I think the book tries to engage with that, but where I wound up with was uh, more in line with the question of, I think, and I think you touched on this earlier, Leslie, is, is what does it mean to live? You know, it's a much bigger and in a way a much simpler question. And the answer for me is that um, you're going to die. <laughs> you know, that's what it means to live. And that's, um, that's its own, uh, I don't know, that's it. <laughs> I'm going to get wrapped up if I try and, if I try and go further. So I'll stop there. <laughs> I know we just like cut the zoom on. <laughs> we all return to our empty room. Um, no, but I mean, it's so true in that sense of the kind of, of the process of writing a book as you sort of have to figure out exactly what house you're standing in uh, even after you've been standing in it for years you know or you realize that it was it's not just a house you're standing in it's actually like an entire kind of weather tormented moor or something like that it's sort of the thing the terms of the thing or the the landscape of the thing getting bigger and bigger around you and sort of revealing themselves to you is is um just, just feels so true and so true to the kind of curiosity and reach and expansiveness of, of the book um and reaching to all those places but then kind of ending with your mother's death has a kind of there's a kind of expansion and containment there um that I hadn't quite thought about before that question and your response to it is really um kind of beautiful um there's um uh yeah there are some questions about beginnings and endings here um uh Tess Enterline uh, says, hi, Michelle, congratulations on the publication of Pure Flame. Um, being aware that your mom had since passed, I'm wondering if you would have liked for her to have been able to read this book. Um, hi, Tess. Uh, you know, I think I've found that, um, you know, there was a long time where I thought and hoped that she would read the book and so did she. And she talked about it as, as our book and, um, uh, I think after she died, um, you know, one of the ways that I was able to convince myself to keep working on it and to keep trying to get it right was this idea that if I could get it right, she'd be able to read it somehow, <laughs> you know, uh, and it's, you know, you know, writers play all sorts of tricks on themselves to keep, uh, working, um, and that was one of mine, um, I'd like to think, uh, that she would be proud of it, I, I, I would, it was always in my mind that, you know, I needed to write a book that I wanted her to read, you know, that was about us and that, you know, as I, I, I touch on, you know, toward the end of the book when I actually did show her an excerpt from the book and it didn't go well at all. <laughs> um, uh, that, um, you know, it is possible to write a book about a mother and a daughter that is, you know, and in our case, um, I think the way I put it is something like, um, I mean, I forget how I put it, but it's, it's it, you know, that the, the, the anger, the anger was not at her, the, 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 you know, it was, it was an anger, if there's anger in the book, it's, it's a, it's a fueling anger, you know, it's, it's a, it's an anger that's of her, it's an anger that's part of our legacy, and anger is okay, you know, like anger, um, and I would hope, I guess what I'm trying to say is I would hope that if, if some, the book being what it is, that, that she would, I would have found a way to to show her that and and um you know that she would love it there's such a i i just um i love that part of the book so much that i was able to to get to it but you I, you you write i couldn't say then how i longed for my mother to credit a rage of mine that was not about but of her to see mm -hmm. it as an ally in my own life and in hers and whatever story i might choose to tell about us both which is um just so lovely. I, and I think though, I'm, I guess just read from near the end of the book, I don't think it's a spoiler, even on an emotional or intellectual level. It's just a really gorgeous moment. Um, um, there's a question here from Sarah. 
um hi Sarah um uh hi Michelle I think about it's a beautiful question about beginnings and endings hi Michelle I think about the end of this is running for your life a lot that image of you running alone did you feel like that essay was a jumping off point for you to write pure flame and do you feel like you can return to that essay now and the idea of being alone in a changed way since writing about your mom Mm. Return to it. Yeah, I haven't read that essay in so, so long. Um, yeah, and when I think about it, I, I, I think of that loneliness. I mean, I, to go back to the, the body's question, you know, what I think about is, is the loneliness that gets carried in the body, you know, and how it can be a kind of sickness. Um, and I think it was one that we shared um, at that same moment in, in our respective lives, unfortunately, um, and, y and yet weren't able to, you know, connect over it and, and offer each other company, company and comfort. Um, so in that sense, I think it, it probably is a jumping off point for this project because I wasn't really done investigating that part of my life and, the, and the, all of the um, complex things that uh, that shaped it, um, but I'm definitely interested in in yeah exploring um, I think the alienation and in all its forms. But it, so in, in that in the running essay, it's 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 its own thing, obviously. And, and in in this book, um, you know, the alienation is a kind of shared thing and one that I wanted to chart you know, this, this larger context for it, all the forces that were being brought to bear in it, I suppose in some larger effort to, to try and to try and understand why it, why it happened the way it did, you know, what, um, to, to put it very simply, you know, why, why did it go like that? Um, uh, yeah, it's a great yeah. question. Well, I think too about how you said, you spoke earlier about the ways in which writing close to bodies in the in the making of this book sort of also allowed you to find these zones of overlap between you and your mother or maybe even surprising zones of overlap in your bodily experiences but thinking about sort of loneliness as something carried in a body or or, or through a body as maybe also a, a kind of overlap as you were just saying is mm -hmm. um, it's really lovely as well um mm -hmm. it's so it's so um there's the question of endings. There's no good place to end. So it's so lovely to be able to talk to you about this book. And I would really truly urge um, anybody here tonight who doesn't already have this beautiful, beautiful object of this beautiful, beautiful book um, to um, support politics and prose and get it from them. Um, it's a, a wonderful bookstore. It's so lovely to be hosted by them tonight. Um, and I'm just, I'm celebrating you and this, and this object and all the, people who will be so grateful as I was to have it in their lives and in the world. Thank you, Leslie. That means so much to me. It's so good to talk to you about this book. Uh, I should have been dying to, to do it actually. <laughs> it's weird to do it in a public forum, but <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> Um, well, absolutely wonderful. Thank everybody who is here tonight for coming. Yeah, and um, everyone who showed up. I'm so appreciative. And um, here's to being in our bodies in a room with you someday soon, Michelle, which I hope can come to pass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Is that it? Can we sign off? Right. I think so. I think so. The Zoom ending. Um, such a pleasure. Congratulations. Thank, Thank everyone you. for coming. Bye, everyone.